Shri A. S. Chandiyok is a dis distinguished Indian senior advocate practicing in the Supreme Court and High Courts in India. He was president of Delhi High Court Bar Association for a record six terms. A former additional solicitor general of India, Shri Chandiyok was also principal counsel to the European Union Commission from August 2013 to March 2016. Shri Chandiyok is president of Madhyam Council for Conflict Resolution, a professional organization aiming excellence in the development of law and conflict resolution. He is vice chairman of Society of Insolvency Practitioners of India and member advisory committee of the Insolvency and Bankruptcy Board of India. So is also chairman of the working group under the Insolvency and Bankruptcy Board of India. Sri Chandiyok is member London Court of International Arbitration, member Indian Council of Arbitration, accredited mediator of Singapore International Mediation Institute. He was formerly, he has formerly been a member of ICC arbitral tribunals for international arbitration. He has also appeared before various arbitral tribunals of ICC at various places abroad and has represented the Indian government in the Enron arbitration in London. Sri Chandiyok has been conferred many prestigious awards, including Outstanding Jurist 2000 by J.N. Koshal Jurisprudence Center, New Delhi, Award for Rendering Meritorious Legal Services from Delhi Citizens Forum for Civil Rights in 2002, the National Law Day Award from the Honorable Prime Minister of India, Dr. Manmohan Singh, for the contribution made in the practice of civil law. The leader in the profession, leader of the Bar Award 2007 from the Bar Council of Delhi in March 2007. And also Sikh of the Year 2010 by Sikh Forum International, London, UK. He has also been awarded two honorary doctorates. So I very warmly welcome to you. Uh, to this humble initiator. So it's, it's a blessing, it's a privilege to have you um, uh, have this occasion of learning from you on this very important topic of arbitration. And I humbly request you to kindly take this class forward. Thank you so much, Keshav. Let me first start with a very good morning to everybody. The very fact that so many of you have joined on a Sunday morning itself gives me a very good sense to say that the rule of law in this country would continue to develop, continue to make waves, continue to bring justice in terms of the constitutional norms, the doorstep of every dispute. I'm sure that all of you here have been shall able to resolve disputes more than adjudicate them so that the society has harmony, peace around. As Bishop said, the floods are all over. Now, you see from Punjab, Delhi, to other parts of the country, we all pray for all those who are affected by it. May God bless them with long, happy, healthy life. And let all their things that are in, remain intact and they come back to the normal mainstream as soon as possible. Coming to the topic that has been assigned to me, let me thank Mr. Alex and Kesha in particular for having given me this opportunity. In fact, it's just a matter of coincidence that we were intending at Madhyam to start our classes. In fact, I found in the recent experiences that even the statement of claims and the statement of defense being put in an arbitration was not as we would expect. We are wanting India to be the arbitration hub. Just to give you a flavor of it before I go further, that after 2015, namely when we brought Commercial Courts Act into this legislative field and operation, for you is that Section 10 incorporates arbitration. And consequently, all amendments in terms of their principle, maybe not CPC, their arbitration is not bound, they can have their own rules, except for the institutional arbitration, they all agree on some rules. The pleadings must be 
as far as possible in conformity with the amended provisions under the Commercial Code Act. We were about to begin that, just that one of us has fallen sick and pray for her long and healthy life before we come to that. But coming back to the Arbitration and Conciliation Act 1996, let me tell you, my friends, before this legislation of 1996, we had a legislation of Arbitration Act of 1940, which was pre partition. This act continued in this country till we brought the legislative intent, new legislation, repealing the old act only in 1996. For all those years, the law was governed by that act. And I find in some of the jurisdictions, cases under the old act are still pending final disposal. We only pray, I can only do that. I request all of you. Any one of you have that, it's time that you must bring to the notes of the learned arbitral court to very kindly consider and dispose of the same. So the law has been changed even from 1996 as I go by. I'll bring to your kind attention how the law and arbitration is developed. But when the Arbitration and Conciliation Act was brought in 1996, we mainly, mainly had three chapters to it, part one, part two, and part three. The chapter was the wrong word, in fact, it should be in three parts. Part one applied to domestic arbitration. Part two applies to arbitration that are held or foreign arbitrations. Or you have an arbitration agreement where one is an Indian party, one is a foreigner, or and is governed by either by the Geneva Convention or what we see today, the Geneva Convention is taking a backseat. We mostly have arbitrations governed by New York Convention. The third part is actually conciliation, where a person becomes a conciliator and helps to resolve the matter. We find a synonymous situation has come in though there is some difference between conciliation and mediation. But we found after 1989 amendment to we find the, the mediation has taken a seat, the unfair trial laws were amended, and ultimately, we, the India signed this what we call the Singapore Convention for dispute resolution by mediation, national disputes. And India is signatory, but unfortunately, from there till date, we have not been able to incorporate that into our. Uh, system or into a legislative intent. I think somebody said that I was not clear. Are you able to hear me, all of you? So, yes, sir, uh, we're able to hear you. Coming back to the act, Jeffrey I said this was in three parts. The third part is conciliation, which is now being synonymously used with mediation. Mediation bill has already been approved for Lok Sabha, but in Rai Sabha, it has already gone again to the parliamentary committee. We have made our representation that the act requires amendments. We hope to see the act as they were placed before one of the probably parliamentary sessions, which must take place because of the need of the hour today. However, coming back to the situation that we have, arbitration was brought in as an alternative dispute resolution. Jurisprudence, we developed quite a bit of jurisprudence in 1940 Act, but the Act itself was effective in many ways. 1996 brought a new chapter in arbitration. And thereafter, there have been amendments to the last amendment of 2019 with the aim and object to ensure that the arbitration jurisprudence developed in this country at a very fast speed. We are able to reach out for dispute resolution in terms of the Arbitration Act faster, cheaper, and in a time frame. So, for the first time, though, the law has always been that we shall 
every actually adjudication must be aggressively disposed of. The cost of the parties must be minimized. The justice must reach to the person immediately. But the timelines have not been laid. Initially in 2015, the Act brought for the first time a time situation when they said the arbitral tribunal from the date of their reference will be able to make an award within one year. That got amended then in 2019 to say that arbitration, arbitrator is bound to, shall make an award on the word of the statute of section 29 capital A to say that you will then have a one year period to make an award. Now it's an obligation cast on the arbitral tribunal, whether it's institutional or ad hoc, to say that you must make an award within one year. Parties, because arbitration is party autonomy, so parties are given another six months time to consent to give an extension for the arbitral tribunal to complete and thereafter the functus of your situation of the tribunal comes. Coming back to the beginning of this statute, you will find the important part is section 7. Section 7 tells us what is an arbitral agreement, what can be an arbitration agreement, apart from a normal statutory to situation where you say you have a written contract which contains an, in unequivocal terms the intent of the parties to very to refer the matter to arbitration. There has been some debate with respect to how to draft an agreement. And that would be, I think, I would have to request Keshav that we need to split up your classes to see the arbitration agreements construction itself. How do you draft that is important. And that's the beginning of every dispute as I see. And to give you on a lighter rain early morning to tell you that I had an occasion to have an arbitration with, for contract with me, which says the arbitration, the underlying contract was governed by Indian law. It's a, really speaking, with a foreign company, which was going to extract for the purpose of our fuel. And then it said arbitration shall be governed by the unsitral model. The curial law is unsitral. However, the arbitration shall be governed by English Arbitration Act and the place of arbitration shall be Malaysia. You can understand how much conflict it brought and the matter ultimately had to right go up to the Supreme Court to get that matter resolved. But the fact of the matter remains is still there's a dispute going on because the statute uses the word place. Now, if they say place, there is a dispute with respect to venue and seat, which we expect that one we will be able to do it once the statute gets amended. And I think high time is the legislature keeps that in mind. And instead of the word place, it is substitutes it by the word seat, all this controversy, all that time that we spend in court deciding that will get over. So section 7 of the Arbitration Act, as I was submitting, actually has a very wide width also. Even if you make a claim and the other side accepts adjudication through arbitration, even that can be binding arbitration. I Supposing I write a letter to say, let's have a matter resolved by arbitration. That matter, if the other side accepts that part, and to give you a latest trend in the world after the digital part has come in, the Canadian court has now said, if on a Zoom call or otherwise, you have raised your thumb, that itself amounts to a agreement between the parties, which may also contain an arbitration. So the law is still developing though the digital world is concerned. But the fact of the matter is, Section 7 takes into its ambit. It's a very wide section which tells us how an arbitration agreement must be should be in writing, there should be an intent to go to arbitration. So normally speaking, if you all know, and I'm sure all of you are lawyers, or coming to become a lawyer, under the provisions of law in section nine of the Code of Civil Procedure, you don't need any backing of a statute to file a suit. 
or to raise a demand. That is the inherent power of your of any disputant to raise the jurisdiction of a civil court. But that civil court gets substituted by the arbitration. And Section 5 of the Arbitration Act tells us that when there is an arbitration clause, the civil suit will not be filed. Section 8 gives us now a new picture after the amendment. Section 8 is a section which tells us if there is an arbitration clause between the parties or an agreement between the parties, then you have to refer the matter to arbitration only. And a civil suit would not be the right forum to do. Suppose it is an arbitration agreement between me and Keshav, and I file a suit, Keshav is entitled to invoke Section 8 of the Arbitration Act to the court to say, sorry, this matter cannot go to the civil court. It has to be done at adjudication by arbitration. Therefore, Section 8 now uses very peculiar words, if I can use that expression correctly. It says, notwithstanding anything contained in any other law, a judgment or a de decree even by the Honorable Supreme Court. Therefore, everything gets excluded and the limited jurisdiction is given to that civil court, which actually becomes the judicial authority in terms of the Arbitration Act to decide only that parties must go to arbitration. Unless on the face of it, it seems that the arbitration clause is void or invalid. To give you an example, supposing a Bill or a testament of somebody has an arbitration clause to say that if case there's a dispute between the parties in relation to my estate, then the testamentary jurisdiction will not be invoked, but arbitration will be invoked. The law says no, I can't do arbitration. A trust matter, dispute intercede between the trustees. In terms of section 92 of the Board of Civil Procedure, you can go to civil court, but you can't refer that dispute to arbitration. So these are some exceptions that you will find in law, where those exceptions, if they are spelled out or apparent on the face of record, the court will decline under Section 8. The court actually becomes, as I said, a judicial authority and consequently is not the jurisdiction of the civil court, but the jurisdiction of a judicial authority to decide that issue. Once you do that, then the question comes as to what will you do if the court was to exercise that jurisdiction wrongly or arbitrarily or contrary to the mandate of it. That's why in Section 8 also today, a law provides you that you can go to court and ask for setting that up. That brings me, if there is a dispute of the judicial authority fields, whether such dispute can, is arbitrable or not, there's some kind of dispute, it can't decide it under Section 8. It must leave that to the arbitral tribunal. A person must raise that jurisdictional question under Section 16 of the Arbitration Act before you go forward. So 16 is before filing your statement of defense, you can raise that claim with respect to the civil. Over the period of time, we found that neutrality, impartiality, which are the backbone of any judicial system or adjudicatory system, if I can correctly say so, is somewhere getting diluted. The law came to say, you will not, you will have to have an impartial arbitrator. And for that impartiality, they also brought within their ambit a schedule to say when there is a conflict of interest, when an arbitrator is disqualified, to find those of you who have been looking at it to say that if there is a situation which we say, supposing we were to look at what we found that when many points of time, it was not possible for a person, the arbitral clause itself says that a, for example, national, wherever there are public sector undertakings, this Highway Authority of India, National Highway Authority of India, 
the clauses usually usually used to provide that the chairperson would be entitled to unilaterally appoint an arbitrator. That law has undergone a change. Such a clause is not valid any longer, and therefore parties have to resolve that dispute under Section 11 of the Arbitration Act. So you find Section 9, 11, 14, 15, and then goes to 27, and then goes to 34 before they are the jurisdiction of the arbitral, not the tribunal, but the arbitral court. So I'm first dealing with the arbitral court now before I go to the arbitral tribunal jurisdiction. In section nine, like you all know, if one has to ask for an interim order or one has to ask for some interim relief, including a relief with respect to security, for example, or some kind of subject matter of the arbitration has to be safeguarded to move a petition under section nine to the arbitral court to say that please injunct the other side or pass an interim order safeguarding the subject matter of arbitration or whatever is the situation with respect to facts and particular to the case. So jurisdiction of the section nine is you can invoke it before, during, and after arbitration. So the wish of section nine, so far as the jurisdiction of the arbitral court is concerned, maybe the high court, maybe the district court, is very wide. You can invoke it even before going to arbitration. You can invoke it during the arbitration. You can invoke it even after the arbitration. So all jurisdiction is the jurisdiction of the section nine till the enforcement proceeding starts, which will come later when I'm going through that. So jurisdiction of this section nine, the law, apart from saying you will you can appoint a receiver, you will do this, all those provisions that you find under all 39, you want it. The one last sentence is any other interim relief which the arbitral court feels is can be granted. So the wish of that is almost exercise of power under section 151, which we normally call inherent power to the court. So that's the situation with respect to the same. Then comes section 11, as I said, if there is a dispute with respect to the appointment of the arbitral tribunal, then you knock the door of the court to appoint a person or an arbitral tribunal, which is impartial. Here I want to make a point for your kind consideration on this. We have found now over a period of time that normally speaking, one has to appoint three arbitrators. You might have two member arbitrators so normally three member arbitrable tribunal is especially in the more integrated commercial matters you need somebody also to assist the arbitral tribunal if supposing it's a construction contract you will probably need an engineer as an arbitral tribunal member to be doing that but over the period of time it has come to our notice that we find three arbitral tribunal is not cost effective which would be the first yeah, thing that we must learn that the cost of the parties must be saved. With one person there, you will be able to expedite your arbitration proceedings and it will result in an award one way or the other. However, it is not that three member arbitral tribunal is bad. When three members coming from different forums were to sit down and apply their mind, the award was bound to be something which we call which can be is final and cannot be touched even by the arbitral court under section 34. Then comes the neutrality part, which I said, if the arbitral tribunal is in place, and you still find that some arbitrator, one of the members of the arbitral tribunal, is not so there's some apprehension in your mind that he's not going to be neutral, impartial, etc. So you will within 15 days move the arbitral tribunal to say. You find it in yourself, and if it does not do so, you can knock the doors of the court in the section 14, and then the termination takes place by the arbitral court on hearing the parties with respect to the same. So, this is the initial situation before actually the arbitration has actually commenced. So, you start from giving a notice, which notice comes, of course, in the legislative intent is section 21. You invoke the arbitration. You must say what are the disputes. Must, it's not that you right, type your statement of claim along with it. 
but you must specify what are the two things. It must have all those material facts to the other side and suppose that arbitral tribunal can be constituted by single member or if it's institutional, it will go to institution or you nominate your own arbitrator as a three member arbitral tribunal. Okay? And if he does not come forward to respond to you, your choice again is not that you will unilaterally appoint that arbitral tribunal. One will have to go to the honorable court for appointment of the arbitral tribunal or the any member of the tribunal. So, jurisdiction of the court is more important now. Unilateral appointment cannot be made today under the Arbitration Act by any of the parties. But even if the clause provides so and there's a dispute, so yes, both parties may agree that SS Ray may be appointed, as I see him on the screen, to be appointed to an arbitral tribunal, or Mr. Keshav can be appointed to an arbitral tribunal, Mr. Tiwari can be appointed. That's fair enough. There's no problem. As long as these parties are agreeing to appoint the tribunal. And in fact, I want to add here now that we are at this constitution of arbitral tribunal, I think experience over the world gives me this sense to bring to your mind of this that it is time that we bring the practitioners, lawyers to the members of the arbitral tribunal. So far, we have only dealt with the question. So far, we have only said whenever a question comes before the court, that your lordship may refer this matter to Andrew Mr. Justice so and so, who is retired as high court on the lawyers. No, we did not. We have not come forward with that situation to say, please refer this matter to a lawyer or B lawyer who has some sense of arbitration and will be neutral and impartial. So I think the bar needs to develop this part. The bar needs to bring be more arbitral members on the arbitral tribunal. Because whatever is the, I'm not saying retired judges are not competent, these are misunderstanding. My view is when you have a person who is doing commercial matters, for example, if you are doing something, it will be easier for you to expedite your matters. And bar must also get this role for adjudication, adjudication. I'm looking at it from two points of view. A, if a youngster, for example, if the claims are small and a youngster is appointed as an arbitral traveler, you're actually giving him a training also he will become a judge tomorrow. He called upon the duty to become the judge tomorrow. So all this is a collective effort of a working of a statute. It has nothing to do with A or B. I'm making a general remark with respect to this. Therefore, the arbitral tribunal, once in place, once you've exhausted, but this jurisdiction of what I refer to under section 13, commencing from 12, 13, 14, 15, remains throughout the pendency of the arbitral tribunal. It is not that it, it dies the death after you have initially come. So, if you come to know about something during the pendency, you can still move the court, arbitral tribunal, asking him to recuse himself. That's the scheme of 12. 13, 14, and 15. And then by an order passed in the afternoon court, the matter gets terminated. The mandate of that particular member or a single member. That brings me to a question 21 I just mentioned, the section where you invoke the arbitration. That brings me to a section 27 also. It's also the jurisdiction of the afternoon court. Supposing in an arbitration you need Witnesses will be summoned from somewhere outside the country. An expert has to be examined. Anything that is, you need to summon him contractually, it will to become that 27 is the jurisdiction again of the civil court to assist the arbitral tribunal in respect to the same. So that's where the second or third time the arbitral court comes in. But that's really procedural. The court will only appoint, ask somebody, ask its own registry, issue someone to a particular witness to appear before the arbitral Now comes the most important part that the proceedings takes place, and then the court comes again, is knocks the door and after the award in section 34. 34 is very limited in its jurisdiction. Normally speaking, an arbitral award is stated to be final. Unless the person who wants to challenge is able to show with evidence 
that there is a patent illegality. The tribunal is not properly constituted. He will not be a violation of principle of natural justice, etc., etc. There is some this divided into two parts. One part is where a party can show the award is bad. The second part is the court has jurisdiction. Have a review of the actual tribunal proceeding to see if these proceedings have been correctly recorded and in the award correctly appreciated. If that goes, the award is set aside. So that also, not normally speaking, it is said that the arbitral tribunal is the judge of facts and law. Even if it goes wrong in interpretation, still the court can't interpret it. So the court's jurisdiction is definitely to review it, but it only set aside that award if that award is contrary to the public policy of the country, or fundamental principle of it is law, not otherwise. A lot of time it was said that public policy would have a very large meaning. We had the Supreme Court to look at. Uh, so you you mute. Pardon. Yes, sir. The post is muted. We are no. There's some there. Some there. This is all happening in digital world. You know, sometimes your finger goes somewhere. All challenges, sir. Yeah, no challenge. There's no problem. So that was section thirty-four, and the award gets set aside on particular situations, particular thing that I have just mentioned. Patent illegality and coming back to that situation of, they said, contrary to Indian public policy. Public policy was initially interpreted very widely, but now gets very narrowly done. And it says that it is in actually split up in two parts. One part is if you find there's a corruption part to it, if there is something else that has come into making the award, obviously it becomes fraudulent. And if that in this situation is continuing the public policy. Yeah. There's yet another thing the patent illegality. And patent illegality shows that the award is contrary to the fundamental principles. That the patent illegality can apparently be found in the award. That's again the jurisdiction of the court. Law earlier to the amendment was that whenever we file an application under section 34. The award would automatically get stayed. But that part has not been changed by amendment. One has to move a motion to ask for stay of the execution of the award. The court has jurisdiction to apply that. If it's a money award, then the court will apply the principles it has in the principles. The court can stay a money degree and thereafter proceed with section 34. A view has been taken that 34 requires deposit with respect to say, I personally feel that I do not think there is any provision under the Arbitration Act which says that unless I deposit the money, I can't be heard in Section 34. So that, my mind, in the absence of any such provision, give you a parity of it, you will find in many jurisdictions, for example, under the Tax Act, under the property tax act, for example, the law says you will have to deposit money before your appeal is heard. There is no such provision in the arbitration act. But in the absence of the provision, you will not get a stay. He is entitled to move for execution. But that can't be said that you can't be heard without deposit. My mind, the other side in whose favor the award is, is entitled to file an execution if there's no stay by the court. But can't say that I can't be heard in support of my petition under Section 34 of the absence of the court. So that pre deposit part is somewhere controversial, which I'm sure over a period of time will again be uh, cleared. All these decks will be cleared soon. We have done wonders, in fact. In fact, all of you must be congratulated. You all have contributed in Delhi. And Delhi is today number one in disposal of arbitration proceedings in the court on the awards. 
We have changed the entire structure in the last four or five years. Notwithstanding pandemic, the disposal rate has been very good. In some cases, because of the volume of the integrations, sometimes get delayed. But still, it is still possible for me to raise my head to say, Delhi High Court happens to be the best in the country. And for disposal of arbitration cases. So please help the honorable judges for disposal thereof. <laughs> Having said that, the execution part now two situations arise. A, if a award is made and three months' time has passed and no application is filed under section 34. Or an application was filed and it will dismissed by the arbitral court. The award becomes akin to a civil court ticket. And consequently, all provisions beginning for execution under Order 21 C starts applying to it. And it gets executed like any decree of a civil court. With that, the domestic court's jurisdiction comes to an end. Then comes to me to the second part of the arbitral travel. You'll find the Arbitration Reconciliation Act itself provides a statement of claims, statement of defense, what should be the points of this determination. And today, even the Arbitral Tribunal gets a summary jurisdiction of the Arbitration Act to see if we can summarily, with summary proceeding, dispose of the arbitration. No such issue arises, or no issue arises with respect to which evidence is called. So, supposing all documents are on record and both parties accept those documents, unless some document is stated to be denied, opposed, or something else, you don't need any evidence. The course then starts not to hear this. Over the period of time, I find almost every arbitral traveler has now said every claim made by a claimant would be treated as a point of determination instead of now following or framing any points of determination. But yes, it's not out of place or out of the similar situation where Article Tribunal makes points of disputes and then goes on to determine one by one. As we find in Order 14, issues are settled by the civil court, and then evidence is laid and there are people. The question therefore comes now, the end, is the first beginning of the statement of claim, defense, documents are admitted tonight. And now I was wanting to bring to your notion why I said earlier that the Commercial Courts Act will come in. So normally I find lately that all or almost all travels pass this order that you will file affidavit or admission denial in terms of the Commercial Courts Act. Therefore, really speaking, the principles have been applied even in arbitration. So once that affidavit of, of admission arrival comes, that's where the arbitral tribunal decides that if the documents are admitted, it proceeds to be right? so The arbitral tribunal then gets the final thing to make an award after hearing the parties. And before I come to that part, I want to bring to your notice that section 29A, after its amendment in 2019, does not carry any caveat that will apply to all arbitrations post that day. In other words, it's not prospective. It is actually clarificatory and applies to all pending arbitration on the date when it came into operation in August 2019. And therefore, pending arbitrations, the arbitrator must make an award within one year, at least from the date this act, this law, 29A, come into play. And you can't say that the arbitration was commenced prior to this date, and consequently, it can't be, it will not apply. The law has to be clear on this. And now we find a tree, and a few weeks ago, an honorable judge of Delhi High Court has gone into this question and said, if the mandate of the statute of one year plus six months, I said that in the beginning, that one year period is given to the arbitral tribunal to decide. Six months given for extension to the parties. However, there is a clause which says either party may apply to the arbitral court, seek their for extension of the arbitration proceeding. And if the court finds the assumption now to make extend the period of arbitration, 
scope jurisdiction is not taken away. Can come so there is no limitation provided. See a distinction between this section and section thirty four. In thirty four, after three months, one month is given to a party for asking for extension of the period of limitation. That means fourth week also. However, not thereafter is the word used in section thirty four. The report jurisdiction is also taken away in section thirty four. It can't condone the delay, whatever with the delay. Similarly, here. The parties get six months, not more than six months, to extend the period of giving an arbitration agreement, uh, arbitration agreement coming to an end. However, the court has given it the power, and there's no embargo put on the court how much time it can extend. That is the second part. The question that is not being debated is that if supposing nobody has moved the court and section 34 has come before the court, what happens to that award? Given after two years or one and a half years, the contract will end up one year and six months. And the matter is still pending, but in my personal view, the award becomes bad because the arbitral tribunal becomes also softer after the statute is here. Unless the court had meant, but once 34 gets filed, then I don't think the court has jurisdiction to condone the delay. First, we'll have to await the judgment of the court with respect to the same. Whether a contribution can be moved and whether the board has to which in respect of the same. So, executing part, as I said, is like any civil court's executive. So, many of us know right from the beginning, people feel that actual problem starts of a case of, at the time of execution. You may be able to get a degree in two years or three years, then really the problem starts when you know where the assets are. And that is why the only provision of all is 41, 21 rule 41 has come in, where you ask the government network to store new assets with respect to them. That uh, should bring me to the end of the part one of the arbitration like, uh, act of 1996. I know my I'm running out of time, but still let me take you forward to part two. Part two deals with New York Convention. If there is an arbitration agreement governed by New York, Convention, then the Supreme Court gets jurisdiction. While Section 11 can be exercised by a district judge or by the Honorable High Court, there the jurisdiction is lies with the Supreme Court to appoint an arbitrator to dispute with respect to appointment. And then comes the section how do you enforce the such award made in terms of New York Convention, the limitation, the very Few limitations is in fact narrower than section 34, but as I see, is patent illegality there also is a subject matter, but with a different rhythm altogether. So even an international award can be set aside, should not be executed by the court. Therefore, in other words, you move the provisions of part two that the court will not enforce that, while in section 34, you are at a stage earlier than that. When you say the award itself is void, there the award is an execution stage where you say award can't be imposed by an Indian court. So, therefore, that is the distinction between part one and part two. I find very rarely one gets a award now or an agreement which parties are now governed by the Geneva Convention. So, there are some still old matters where are called agreements, really, where the disputes are actually have to be governed. However, so far as the New York Convention is concerned with countries all over the world, almost only few countries left now have not done it. All major courts have already adopted New York. The New York Convention is now in power there. So many of us have this feeling that our arbitration act is actually covered by or carbon copy of ancestral laws. My view, that's not correct. The Indian Act has been amended. It has not followed the ancestral model laws in its entirety. It has modified it looking at Indian conditions. It has modified the law. Yes, the principle behind is ancestral, but it has not cut based situation as we normally these days do looking at our computers. The cut based situation need of the our way we need to avoid that one. That is separate subject, and I said we should read it separately. 
Part two is therefore limited with respect to enforcement of all awards or appointment of arbitrator, then enforcement thereof. Now a peculiar situation has arrived now to find an award made here in India. And if the execution has to take place, for example, in China, China judicial system says, sorry, I mean, you have to redo the award. So the award is meaningless, really speaking, because you start from day one. I go to the United States, I don't have reciprocity, and I'm not able to enforce my award. I so the time has come, I think, really through this G20, G everything. The time has come for our judicial people all over the world to sit down together to see how we can bring enforcement of awards at one place. So that one country making an award gets involved in another country without starting the process once again. To add to this, that we, as a member of the body, in respect to BRICS country, the legal forum, we have now drafted rules. And I'm happy to say that the building and route everything for the Bar Association of India is ready. We hope in maybe end of this year or beginning of 2024, we'll be able to bring you to a new BRICS arbitration center. And we are proposing the rules to say, at least between these five countries, should of course include China. I hope we can get it signed. It will be reciprocity. And we'll be honored with all that. Today, business houses are facing. They have the award in their head, can't be enforced in those countries. And in this country, they don't have any asset. So, coming to that brings me to actually part three, as I said earlier, the conciliation. The parties can conciliate between. Mediation is also a forum which the actual tribunal can adopt. It can send a matter to. I want to make a point here. Many arbitral tribunals I saw over a period of time. They start acting as mediators also, and then go back to the adjudicate because they're not in the center. In my view, that's not correct. You must send mediation to a mediator so that his independence can be utilized by the party. He's able to empower the parties to come together to support and probably settle the matter. So you get many things in confidence in mediation, which may not be brought before the other party. The conflict seems to be apparent. So, my humble view would be for your mind consideration that an arbitral tribunal is only adjudicatory. An arbitral tribunal cannot be a mediator which would empower the parties to settle. There's a distinction in law between judicial settlement, a settlement through legal services authority, a settlement through mediation, and a settlement through conciliation. But conciliation and mediation are now being brought very they're overlapping to each other. So we can still say it can be done. But however, the situation looks to me that the arbitration is taking the field today. Mediation, which is part of the arbitration, because ADR is not alternative, it's appropriate situation. So let us all adopt, starting from, if I look at the scheme of the law in section 2012A of the Commercial Courts Act, where mediation has become very, very important, and mediation is actually pre mediation litigation has become compulsory unless you are having an emergency. We must adopt in every dispute that we have, every matter coming to you, we we'll try and resolve it through mediation. I see many of you are trying to take the names, but won't be appropriate. But I see many mediators in the audience today. So this is where. We should learn even that process so that we can request our clients, we can request litigants to adopt that appropriate alternative resolution so that we are able to do so. And so, where the Madhyam is concerned, it comes with a center very soon that we can solve it. We hope we can utilize that for the purpose of resolution. So, we across everybody, we ensure we each one of you will contribute. To this system to resolve these disputes as a condition as possible so that we are able to bring together. Somebody had put the question to me, I think, last time I was speaking somewhere that how do you bring the situation of your religion with dispute resolution? So I said, when I joined the bar, I was given CPC in hand and I said, 
from today you cease to be a Sadar. This is your religion now. For every party or every one of you, irrespective of your caste, color, religion, you all contribute to the cause of justice, which is the constitutional law right in the area. I think we as boys do a job which is most appropriate and is expected of all of us. Thank you all for all your time to listen to me. And I look forward to any question and answer that because I see time is already to 20. To 20, sorry. So, uh, absolutely uh, very, very enlightening and uh, very fulfilling, enriching to every single person who has attended. Uh, so, before I get into the question, just one thing I want to uh, uh, convey to you, sir. This is for uh, because this is this is going to be interaction uh, moving forward from here. That apparently there is a little uh, issue with the uh, volume. So you may have to uh, speak up a little louder while uh, interacting with the questions. I've checked on YouTube; the audio is absolutely fine. Over here, there is apparently some issue. So, so I'll directly now, jump into the questions. Am I better now? So great, sir. Actually, sir, on YouTube, it's all great. I've checked that. Thank you. Thank you. So Just over here, there's a little bit of an issue. Okay. So, so some questions are here that we've received in the chat box. I'll uh, just ask them. So uh, this is Mr. Yes, Shah. Put them on the display them and I'll answer them. Absol uh, so absolutely. I'll. So this is there in the uh, chat box itself. So rather, sir, I'll just ask them if they <laughs> go ask Mr. Shah. <laughs> तुम्हारी आवाज एकदम बराबर और एकदम लाउड आ रही है अच्छा तो अभी के लिए अभिषेक जी व्हाट वी विल डू इज फॉर द सेक ऑफ एंश्योरिंग एन इफेक्टिव इंटरेक्शन राइट नाउ वील टेक द क्वेश्चंस ऑडियो आई हैव चेकड ऑन YouTube इट्स एब्सोल्युटली परफेक्ट सो ऑल इफ इवन इफ समवन इज अनेबल टू एब्सोल्युटली और यू नो क्लियरली अंडरस्टैंड वन थिंग राइट नाउ आई एम क्वाइट श्योर दैट इट विल बी एड्रेस्ड सो देयर विल नॉट बी एन इशू बट लेट्स नॉट यू नो लेट गो ऑफ दिस एब्सोल्युटली फैंटास्टिक अपॉर्चुनिटी सो सो आई विल जस्ट पुट द क्वेश्चंस फॉरवर्ड सो मिस्टर श्याम सिंह सिंगर हैज आस्क्ड अ क्वेश्चन मिस्टर सिंगर वुड यू वांट टू आस्क योर क्वेश्चंस डायरेक्टली योरसेल्फ या या यू कैन आस्क इट देयर इज नो प्रॉब्लम यस मिस्टर सिंगर यस प्लीज सर आस्क my question is sir that whether the arbitration award is binding upon the parties if there some has fraud has been taken place between the party or some concealment has been taken place between the parties that's a fundamental principle shamdi if fraud is alleged and proved everything gets initiated what we call our award if there's a fraud by the parties a fraud which amounts to a fraud in law you see the contract act fraud is defined there in also within legal forums so fraud vitiates everything fraud doesn't need to it won't be binding you are able to establish fraud but the question is where will you do so you will have to do it either under section 34 and if you have that time has gone then you must wait for the execution if the other side still wants to execute it you will plead fraud by filing your objections thank you sir Thank you so much, sir. Uh, so, Mr. Amar Singh has a question. Uh, Mr. Singh, are you here? Mr. Amar Singh, sir, I will ask his question. Uh, his question is: uh, Is the arbitration process the same for both domestic and international arbitration matters? No, the procedure, as I said, the procedure is different. So, no, there is no dispute that even an international arbitration can be done now in India. In fact, now the law has gone that even two Indians can talk to go to Singapore to have their dispute resolved. So the question is, arbitral tribunals once constituted will have to form their own way how they want to take it because this is not binding on them. In my mind, very first order that the arbitral tribunal passes, it must lay down fundamental principles how they were going to conduct the arbitration. So there is no bar. However, in the court process. while if the arbitral award is made in delhi then you will get your 34 here but if even if the award is for the law governing is say singapore law but if the venue or the seat of that is singapore then you will only come here for enforcement then the enforcement is on a limit very limited ground under part 2 of the arbitration 
So, sir, he had another question, uh, which was, how does the choice of seat impact the enforceability and procedural aspect of the arbitral award? I think uh, your answer covered both these questions. I did uh, that. I did touch upon it to say that there is a dispute going on. There was, in fact, three times the Supreme Court, maybe now, next time again, it has to do it. The intent of the parties are important, and therefore I said, when we draft our agreements, we must see how we can, what clarity we find we make that arbitration clause. The first judgment said seat and venue is distinct. Venue may be for the felicitation of the arbitration, but seat may be somewhere else. Then they said when the intent of the parties is clear, then the seat and venue is one and the same thing. Now, the last part, they again reiterated that part that if the intent of the parties is with respect to that the seat of arbitration shall be New Delhi or Bombay or Kolkata, then that is binding on the parties. Therefore, it has to be rolled into the, instead of the word, place in the act, you use the word seat in your arbitration. And that's the clarity of it. I don't think it requires me, if the arbitration clause is clear, that the seat is either New Delhi or Singapore or Malaysia or London, then the matter ends. But many times I find either the word venue is used or the word seat is used. Sometimes both are used. So this is causing confusion. But the fact remains is that the intent of the parties is clear that the seat of arbitration has to be a particular place, then that particular place gets the jurisdiction in law. Just one my add-on question in this. Uh, in case the intent is not clear, what is the uh, procedure then? The intent is not clear. Parties are entitled to, during arbitration, say that. Or when they're asking the court to appoint an arbitral tribunal in the section, both of them can consent to say, we agree that there's some confusion in the arbitration clause. Not she may clarify with the consent of the parties. Because arbitration is party autonomy. So parties can always say, we intended that the arbitration will take place at New Delhi. So Lord Shri may appoint an arbitral tribunal. Thank you, sir. Thank you so kind of you. Uh, sir, Mr. Nilesh Sharma has a question. Nilesh ji, are you here? What do you want to ask Nilesh ji? Uh, so I will ask on his behalf. His question is, binding effect of arbitration clause mentioned in the agreement, is it mandatory that the event of dispute then it will be resolved through arbitration only? As I said, party autonomy is important in arbitration. Supposing there is an arbitration clause and I file a suit raising that dispute, the defendant comes and does not raise the issue on the section 8 of the Arbitration Act to say that it's covered by arbitration clause. Parties are, they have overruled actually both of them and they decide now that they should be able to get the adjudication from the civil court. So the arbitration clause is there, it's binding on the parties, but it's always possible for them. As, as you just now asked me that question whether the seat can be clarified, parties can agree under Section 11 or actually, actually appointing their own arbitral tribunal also, without the court, to say that seat of arbitration shall be New Delhi, Bombay, Calcutta or wherever they want to do so, is possible for them to do. In this case, what you have put a question, there is an existing arbitration clause, but I invoke civil court. The other side comes and doesn't raise the issue of arbitration. So he waives it. I have in fact waived it by filing the suit. He waives it by not moving side to date. And consequently, civil court will not do it. So uh, <clears throat> just an added question to it. If the defendant uh, raises a Section 8 uh, argument at a belated stage, no, what is the law says he has to do it right in the beginning. So if he doesn't do it, he waives that part. He's lost. However, I must Absolutely. need a clarification here. After some amendment, say, for example, under the Lexity Act, say there's an electricity tribunal which takes away the jurisdiction of the arbitral court. So the arbitral electricity disputes are now only adjudicated by a specially constituted tribunal under the Lexity Act. So the, by operation of law, the arbitration goes away so what is Lexity is concerned. Thank you, sir. So kind of you. 
Uh, sir, Mr. S. S. Ray has a question. Mr. Ray, would you want to ask your question, sir? Yes, sir. So, good morning. Sir, question. Good morning. Yes, sir, please. Uh, sir, would you just clarify that part where you mentioned unilateral appointment not permissible vis-a-vis -vis named arbitrator? Where there is a named arbitrator in an arbitration, that is also uh, in the agreement. Yes, there is a unilateral. Right. A named arbitrator is a named arbitrator by both parties. So it's not unilateral in that sense of the matter. So you have named a person who will do the arbitration. Therefore, you only to refer the disputes name. Right? But if the reference does not, if the arbitration clause does not name somebody, then I can't one of the parties start appointing. That was the point I was going to make. And if, even if there's a clause which gives me the right, that clause is no longer valid, I'll have to go to section 11 to get a right to appoint it. Unless there's a Thank consent. You. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. So, Miss Reshma has a question. Reshma, ma'am, would you want to ask your question? Yeah, yes, sir. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. Uh, Please, uh. Yes, sir. Sir, I have a question that uh, as per the section 29A of Arbitration Act, there is a 12 month limitation period. Yes, Whether sir. this limitation period is applicable to the international commercial arbitration, sir? Kindly clarify, sir. 29A does not give that legislative intent to apply to international arbitration. But that does not mean that they have a free word in hand and they can do whatever they want to do. So it says you will still expeditiously dispose of arbitration. So that's, I agree, the domestic arbitration has now been given timeline. International still have some, some flexibility in the joints to probably expedite. But expedition trial, expedition disposal is there. And you see in 29A itself, it says that in case you do it expeditiously, within six months, you get extra fee. It's an incentive granted to the arbitral tribunal also. Thank you, sir. Um, so, thank sir, you, sir. Thank you, Reshmadi. Uh, sir, I'll take the next question. Uh, this is uh, Dr. Shruti. Uh, Ma'am, would you want to ask? So, so we are going beyond the time a little bit, but I'm very grateful to you for your kind questions. Just few questions I'll ask in short. No, no problem. Please go, ahead. Please go ahead. Thank you, sir. So, so the question is uh, where we can find an exhaustive training for arbitration, conciliation and mediation and get certified so that young professionals can get trained to take up this challenging job in hand. First of all, get in touch with Madhyam, go to his website, become his member, and the regular training is taking place there, so you can join the next training there. In fact, we have now been made, uh, the Madhyam has become a extended arm of Singapore Arbitration, Singapore Mediation Institute, so we can now give training to people, and the assessment will be done by SIMI, and you become accredited in the first instance as SIMI mediator. So where the arbitration is concerned, these in, in mediation, you require that training certificate. Where in arbitration, you don't require a certificate. Yet if you attend one of the lectures that which Keshav has now done, or we, we are party, all of us, that itself is a training for us. But he has a formal training with respect to how to make a statement of claim, what all is required in Section 21. You will contact Madhya, he will be able to give you a contact. So thank you so much. And uh, so uh, everyone, please uh, contact Madhyam if you want to uh, understand better arbitration, learn it better. Uh, this is obviously this is a very brief introduction to it. And uh, at the same time, we're also hopeful that we'll get so uh, more frequently uh, for more discussions on arbitration and civil laws, uh, more so to say, and all topics of law, which so may choose to enlighten us on. So just final few questions. I'm not going to take a lot, many more. Go ahead, go ahead. So, uh, sir, Miss Masi has a question. Would you want to ask the question, ma'am? So, so I'll ask. Uh, it says, sir, please clarify how do one fully understand the jurisdiction as mentioned in section nine? Is one to understand the whole jurisdiction lies in the court as clause three of section nine states arbitral tribunal and as Understood from section 2D, arbitral tribunal means a sole arbitrator or a panel of arbitrators. You see, prior to the amendment to the Arbitration Act a few years ago, you would find section 9 was absolute. That the arbitral tribunal, arbitral court was given that power to do so. 
that power is still retained in terms of the statute of power. A caveat has not been put. That if Section 9 petition, a tribunal has been constituted, then Section 17 gives the power to the tribunal to pass in term order as given to the court. In fact, you see 9 with 17. To my mind, 17 is much larger in jurisdiction by the arbitral tribunal. Therefore, and now the change of law is that earlier tribunals in terror models were not executable, they were executable. So, therefore, substitution is to the arbitral tribunal, the reason being it will have better material before it. So, nine remains at its jurisdiction. You can go to this arbitral court to ask for interim relief. It is possible that if the tribunal gets constituted, the learned judge may say, I shift this to file 17 till file 17 is decided or entertained the present entire management will come to the so, uh, thank you, sir. So kind of you. Uh, so I had a few questions. I think many of them have been addressed today. Uh, so I'll, sir, considering the paucity of time, I'll just advance one question before you. And uh, so it's a, so you, you can just answer it in bullet points if you want. So my question is, sir, why arbitration? Why arbitration is, the answer is threefold. A, looking at the situation of this country, looking at our own situation as India, I think if you see the statistics, disputes have arisen many fold in our world. But we have not been able to create infrastructure for our courts. We have neither been able to appoint more honorable judges. And more so, the system of appointment is there's still a defect there too. Therefore, they are, they are not able to meet the dockets that they reach the order. That's why arbitration, one part. The second part is that in an arbitral tribunal, as I said earlier, supposing the dispute in respect to an industry. Now, if you get an arbitral tribunal where a person who's acquainted with such industry is part of the tribunal, then you get into it in the niceties of that and the judicial decision or the arbitral award is better than adjudication that you do. The third is that if you expedite that matter, you'll be able to get faster award than you probably get into so court. So all they've cut short the parties, litigation cost comes down, everything. Do I appreciate one of the questions in arbitration today raised is that the fee of the arbitrator is very high. That has also been taken care of now by the statute. Then of course there is a situation that if parties were to agree to get Mr. Ray or you or country or anybody as arbitrator, then they can decide their own thing. But I think the tribunals should now consider, unless the facts of the case or the disputes are voluminous, when we stick to the schedule granted by the statute as far as possible. There can be an exception, and I'm not saying sometimes the questions are so deep, so integrate that it may not be easier for the outcome travel to spend a lot of time with it. So looking at the quantum of work, the fee should be fixed. And I think we all, whether they are for arbitrator or lawyer, we all must contribute to ensure that arbitration becomes needs to be cheaper than what I see in litigation cost. So, so that's very well put, sir, uh, very briefly and concisely. So now, so one for advocates. So why arbitration for advocates? What advantage? So mostly there's a huge challenge uh, between litigating lawyers and uh, ADR lawyers. And uh, so you very, uh, so brilliantly, you just put the definition of ADR from uh, alternative to uh, appropriate dispute redressal mechanisms. That's really fantastic, sir. So why for advocates? Why arbitration for a lawyer is, again, there are many answers to it. We find many of us have initially the fear of that court. When we stand in the court, we start fumbling. Times have gone when I, when I joined the bar, for example, and if I was fumbling, the judge would ask me, is that my first appearance? If I would say yes, the order will come through. But that time is gone. The bar is so big, the disputes are so large, the dockets are so big. Still, there are times when I find judges doing it, not that they've not done it. 
but arbitration will give you a gateway to open yourself up. It will give you a training forum because you are either on VC or not physical as started. You are sitting on a chair in front of an arbitrator, arbitrator and addressing the learned judge or learned arbitrator with respect to the case. So it trains you to go forward. And I said that would be one part. The second part would be that it gives you a timeline to dispute the resolution part. Therefore, you are also as a lawyer because pleading that will be completed within six months. So pleading that will be completed within six months, then I must expedite my pleading. So it is putting me to timelines as a lawyer. So I learn how do I maintain timelines to ensure justice to my client, to whomsoever I'm representing. So from lawyer's point of view also, and I think I want to dispel uh, one of the things that I don't know whether people have in the audience have it or not. I remember when in 2006 a question arose with respect to mediation. I was then the president of the High Court Bar Section, and the question arose that many people came forward. In fact, my own view was this that the rules are better. How will we do that? The fees will come down. We'll have less work. But over the period of time, I see you have to learn mediation advocacy, which also gives you money. So opportunities come in life where you can opt for it, looking at your own self. Some people may love to go to court today, look at the Chief Justice of India. He doesn't entertain anybody physically. Everything has to be BC. So if you are on BC, then what are you getting kick out of it? The kick that you get, the only physical that we reach before. The other side before you are everything. Half the time, you can't even see the body language of the judge on BC. So that is coming as an impediment, but we, I'm sure over the period of time we'll be able to bring three CDL, the situation, or something else comes into picture. We'll probably be able to do that. So for a lawyer, it is a forum that he can venture into because the industry, the business houses are not wanting to go to court, looking at the cost, looking at the time consumption. So they have thought arbitration and mediation are alternative and they are appropriate for them to resolve their disputes faster. Therefore, for lawyer also, because he's after all to do this kind of justice is to assist the court. If you're not assisting the court, you're assisting the original arbitrator, it's one the same thing. So that's why he's getting his due. It's not that he's not learning law. It's not that he knows, doesn't know how to draft. He'll do everything as he does in the court. So for him also, it's advantageous that he does into timelines and sees more cases go through his hand. His experience becomes larger in various disputes, and therefore that he gets the learning experience. So, <clears throat> so uh, thank you so much, sir. It's really very really kind of you, you and grateful to you all of you. Is, thank you to you, Kajal. Really, really grateful to you for sharing these the absolutely team, fantastic and insights. Participants, and thanks to all of you. Look forward to see all of you. Thank you. Have a great, great Sunday. So lots of messages in the chat box thanking you. So I behalf, I thank you on behalf of every one of the participants, sir. It's been really enlightening, really wonderful, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you. And so I hope and I pray on behalf of everyone and in front of everyone that we'll get more opportunities of learning from you. Because whenever you want, you tell me. I'll either come myself or send somebody. There's something else that I feel that somebody else can also do it. Ab absolutely. You're also part of the audience. You should in fact give me a link so that I can also learn. Not that I can't do it. Learning so, never stops for a lawyer. So that's very kind and humble of you. And we'll take that humility and humbleness with you as the essence of this class. And I'm quite sure that everyone will want to uh, go through this class over and over again because of the uh, very explicit nature and the very uh, elaborately that you've explained the entire concept of arbitration to us today. So uh, with your permission, I seek to very warmly. Thank you and in this class.